must be challenged me to recreate any Atari game of my shooting. Challenge accepted. One year later. Hey, better late than never, right? Let's go. Oh. This is the game we're gonna recreate. No, wait, that's my game. Uh, this is the game we're gonna recreate. Demon attack for the Atari console. Enemies arrive in waves. When you've cleared the screen from all enemies, a new wave of them appears. In the original game, only three big enemies can be at the screen at once, but I wanted a bit more action, uh, so... Oh my god, what have I done? Okay, I'm not trying to make an exact replication of this game. I am freestyling a little bit along the way. The enemies can shoot, and the tiny ones, they can charge. Man, so little guys... You gain a life when you successfully clear the screen. But hold up! Only if the lost enemy was killed by you. If a charging enemy dies from crashing into the ground, you get nothing. NOTHING! That's all of the game mechanics. Now we know what we're gonna make, so let's make it. When this challenge approached me about a year ago, I thought I'm definitely going to use C++ with SFML or SDL. But a year has passed and I've delved into the wondrous world of Rust. Rust, 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 Rust. <laughs> My favorite programming language. So we're gonna use Rust. But what about game frameworks? Are we gonna use GGEC? Bevy? Oh, bevy, bevy, bevy. Piston? Amethyst? No. We're gonna use Macroquad. Macroquad came onto my radar when I worked on the game Digiscape. Hey, if you haven't seen that, check that out after this video. With Digiscape, I used this library called GGEC, but to port it to the web, I needed to use another library. It was a port of GGEC called Good Web Game, I think. The author of this port of GGEC, he had made his own game framework. I like the work of the author, so let's check out his game engine, Macroquad. I have used a lot of game frameworks over the years, so to learn a new one wasn't too bad. My first steps was figuring out how the entry point works and then how to run a game loop. After that I messed around with the rendering sprites in different ways. Step one, get something to the screen. Look at that. Well, that is crazy. <laughs> something I rely a lot on when learning new libraries is to use the documentation and the example code provided. I recorded almost every single minute spent on this project in this time lapse you're watching, and you'll notice I rely heavily on the documentation in the beginning to figure out how to do basic things, but as time goes on, of course, the less I need the documentation. In these time lapses, you'll also notice that the daylight is changing a lot, and that is because I worked on this game later hours of the day, or sometimes in the morning, so that I could focus more on the time working on the voxel RPG game. Screen resolution is done. It was surprisingly quick to make. Uh, I've done this many times before. The game size is... it scales with the screen. It seems like the Atari games... well, this one is stretched. Look at this. This is a screenshot of the Demon Attack game. Let's make it half the width. Boom! I don't know about you, but that looks reasonable. What is going on? As you saw, when I reach a milestone, I usually stop the recording and, and show you guys the progress. I wanna go through these time lapses and these short clips. Then we're gonna take a look on the code on the game, see what I liked, what I didn't like, what did I think about the game engine. And of course, I'm gonna show you guys more of the game. So, let's speed things up a little bit. Let's see me program and drink coffee and uh, be happy. Progress report, check it out. Boing! I got stuff moving around. I got animation. Amazing! You can't see my face, but check this out. It's almost a game. Amazing! Do you know what? I recorded a lot of time lapse. So, we're gonna do some quick commentary over what I'm doing, and, and then we will be done with the game, and then we can look at the good stuff. The green rectangles on the screen are collision boxes I am debug drawing using a very simple function in the macroquad library. Adding in the score text took some time, because I had to do it programmatically, and, and there was no way to get the actual screen size width of the text. We can now see the spawning in animation at work. This is the final version. And at this point in the time lapse, I started implementing that. I added the ground background, and it is just one pixel wide image that I stretched out. 
We also see the health bar coming in, and I'm drawing this very weird, funky animation when the player takes damage. In the timeless we can see this took some time to implement because I had to programmatically figure out how to offset this image. It's really fun seeing where I implemented the charging enemies because they fly so fast in the time lapse towards the player. We'll see more when we play the game later how that works. I added some new enemy textures and that really made a big difference. After that I wanted to have a main menu screen, I made a complete game state management implementation. I could just hack that together and that would probably be fine, but I just wanted to build a state management system, so yeah. We're at the end of the time lapse, and I'm gonna attempt to build this game to the web so you guys can try it out. Let's see what happened. First try, let's go. And... Will it work? Yeah, go! No? Ah, it's working! Look, it's in the browser! Look, look, look! And sound works! <laughs> Every time I manage to put a Rust project up on the browser, I kind of freak out a little bit. It is a good feeling. Rust runs in the browser, I know, it's insane! It's insane! Oh, I also want to show you guys something. My mustache! No, not that! Check this out. A really cool thing in Rust is that they have a formatting tool. When I'm productive, I'm not really thinking about the formats. Let's look at the code real quick. It's not gonna take long to find something bad. Are you seeing how much space I'm using on the screen? Like this line? How many characters is that? Or, hmm, we got that. We're gonna write cargo. Boom! It formatted everything. Automatically. Nothing goes beyond this point. Beautiful. Let's see how many lines of code this is. <laughs> We're up to 1,800 lines of code. That's quite a lot. 400 of them was added when I formatted it. That's pretty crazy. <laughs> I think recreating already existing games is a great way to learn how to make games. Or to learn a new framework. Rust is a programming language I have used for about 8 months and, and when I started out learning how to make games with Rust, I had a really hard time, mainly because of the language being so different than what we're used to. But having stuck with Rust for so long just feels so rewarding, because I reached a point where the issues I had previously, I already know how to solve because I have gone through that hard time and I already have the answer to some of the questions. With that said, let's take a look on the source code of this game. By the way, the source code is publicly available on GitHub, and of course there's a playable link down below. I have to warn you though, at the time of this recording everything is in one file. I wanna move the stuff out into files, but that's probably at least a day of work. My knowledge on uh, project structure isn't that good with Rust actually. Let's take a look on one of the most exciting parts of the code, which is the enemy. The enemy does a surprising amount of things. At least 30% of the source code is about handling the enemies. I'm using a sort of state machine to handle how the enemies behave. In Rust, this is insanely easy to do thanks to the enum data type. The enemy state can only be in the form of one variant. Either we're spawning, we can also be in the normal state, which the enemy doesn't do much in the normal state, it just moves around randomly until it is time to shoot, and that's when it enters the shooting enemy state. In the case of the smaller enemies, after a certain amount of time, it will go into the homing state, where it's when it flies towards the player. So here's the beautiful thing, so none of these states share data. Spawning doesn't care about when it's about to shoot, the shooting doesn't care about when it's about to walk. When we are in these states, we have a specific data for that state. There are things however that needs to be shared across all of the states. One example is position. Every single state manages position. So when we take a look on the actual enemy class, it only has two things. It has a shared state and the current state. Are you lost already? Okay, good. Let's continue. These states doesn't have that much data, but let's look on an example. The shooting state. The shooting state has two variables. It has the shooting timer and how many shots it has left to shoot. Before looking on the shooting state, we're gonna see how it all comes together. The enemy has an update function and it does only two things. Well, technically more, but it only does two things we care about. So we have our current state right here. The match statement is like a switch. 
if we are in the spawning state, then we will call the function where we handle the spawning logic. And right here we can pass in the specific spawning data. We also pass in the share data and a bunch of other things. Depending on which state we are in, the update function calls the appropriate update function. Let's take a look on the shooting state for example. There's a lot of code here, but don't freak out, okay? What we care about right now is the shoot timer. If the shoot timer is less than zero, then we will shoot projectiles. Should I spawn one or two bullets? Well, in the case of two, I need to offset both of them so they aren't on top of each other. And then I add bullets in a bullets list. If I only spawn one, then well, I spawn one bullet to the bullet. And for fun, I actually added so the enemy moves up when it shoots like a recoil. How do we actually move between states? Well, all of these updating functions has a return value and I have this enum called enemy command. When I call the update function, it will return a command and the only thing it can do is to change state. In the case of being in the shooting state, when there are no shots left to shoot, we will return a command that tells the enemy class, hey, you should change state back to the normal state. Let's take a look in the update function. So, we call the update function. All of these update calls will actually return up into this command optional variable. If you don't know a lot about Rust, this will be very confusing. To some of you, this might be interesting. We match against the command and if it has a value, we will see what the command is. Is it change state? Yes, then we will modify the state to the one we passed in. If you look through the source code, you will see that I kind of embraced this state way of doing things quite a lot. It's in the player, it's even in the class that manages spawning of enemies. You know what, let's take a look on that because I think that is really cool. Let's look on the wave manager. The wave manager has two states, spawning and battle. The spawning state has a timer and a counter for how many enemies are left to spawn. The logic for these states are pretty simple. We update the timer and then when the timer is above a certain time, we're gonna spawn an enemy. When there are no enemies left to spawn, we issue a command like we did previously. Way manager command change state. When we have spawned everything, well, we go into the battle state. All the battle state does is just wait until the player has cleared the entire screen. And when that happens, we will issue a change state command to spawning. I think the code for the wave manager is really cool. I haven't thought about how I would do this in other programming languages, but this is very clean. Okay, I'm done with the code. I wanna know what you guys think about including this long coding talk segment. I feel like if you use Rust, then this is very much appreciated, but well, if you don't use Rust, either I'm scaring you away or, <laughs> or hopefully selling you on the idea that Rust is a good language. Anyway, let's wrap this up. This project was a lot harder than I anticipated. Enemies have different states, there's animation, way management, game state handling, audio implementation. Just small things as animating the player bullet recharging or the way the smaller monsters spawn in. I had a lot of fun making this though. I put a lot of love into this tiny little game so try it out, it runs in the browser. Amazing. Now the game framework I used, MacroQuad, has given me a great first impression. Here are the main takeaways of MacroQuad. MacroQuad is without a doubt the fastest compiling game framework I have ever used. This is how fast it compiles to WebAssembly build. And it's done. The code is super clean, I mean, look at this example code. Beautiful. MacroQuad runs in the browser and is super easy to set up when you, when you know the basics. I suppose a downside might be that this is not a widely adopted framework. Meaning you may run into bugs, but given how lightweight the framework is, fixing issues yourself shouldn't be big of a deal. MacroQuad has my seal of approval, I wanna use it more in the future. I put a lot of effort into this project and video, so if you enjoyed it, consider leaving a like. This has been Tan Tan, and I'm Rust. No, I'm out. I mean, I mean I'm out. Bye.